uh, the, the history and nostalgia and uh, uh, comments from the, uh, this is the Cellular Networks of the Future uh, session of six speakers. It's been co-organized by uh, Brian Evans and Pats, uh, which is a, a large number by any, uh, any stretch. And he's now leading the millimeter wave and 5G new radio standardizations at Qualcomm. Very important to have Sudar here to speak about that. Uh, Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, not only for the speaking opportunity, but also for you know being able to come out through this WNCG system. And uh, you've gotten great opportunities because of that. Um, the channel, which I guess has been understood very well, lots of publications here, you know, spearheaded Professor. Integration with the Sub6 radio is something that is really useful here. So that way you could have a coverage layer that commodities we have ability. We tested up 30 miles per hour. Uh, more testing I guess needs to be done at higher speeds. Um, <clears throat> this is the media I'll come to at the very end. Okay. So when you ask this question, so when would you agree that we need a way to see to stay? The question is, okay, can you demonstrate sustained connectivity in outdoors and on line of sight uh, in these conditions? Can you provide sustained mobile communications indoor with wall penetration and body blocking and all these kind of scenarios? And how can you show good enough coverage outdoor? So this goes to show that in an outdoor coverage, even with like, you know, very limited of uh, base station, not a simulation, actual test with two weights, 70 meters by 30 meters in New Jersey. And we can actually, the whole floor was well covered. And this green, I mean, the red and the blue are essentially, you know, showing the connectivity to which base station it was connected. There are some spots again, like, you know, around the, the elevator stairwells and things like that where you don't get coverage. Uh, I would actually like to move on to the next slide because I want everyone to see the video. Uh, and this was talking about uh, the optimized 5G and our, uh, RF front end. This is actually a picture of the actual uh, RF chip that we are talking about for commercial. This is our prototype uh, platform where we have mounted many RF chips in different corners to actually test out what kind of diversity we can provide to make sure there is good enough coverage around the phone. And uh, these chipsets can actually choose between different and it can do, you know, 5G edit adaptive beam forming and beam pattern. And with all of these algorithms in place, we can actually show that uh, all this kind of coverage and connectivity results that we showed earlier is, is possible. And just to give a quick uh, uh, setup before I show the video. So this is the, the, the one on the left is our millimeter wave UE, the, the prototype UE with these different patches, minutes and uh, uh, two and a half minutes, I guess. So I guess it should be okay. So that's our office in Bridgewater. And you can see the two base stations that are placed, one on a van and another one inside the building. And this is a meeting that's actually describing the beams that are closer on the base station. You see two colors for uh, which, uh, which beam it is it's using. And similarly on the UV side, which is on the 360 degree coverage. And that's our mobile base station. Inside the car, and even when you're using the phone inside the car, you have, like, say, 
some R's coming through the back, and some R's coming through the window, and the diversity of the base station actually helps. You can see that when the car turns around, you might actually switch to the other base station sometimes. And this is our uh, indoor test. That's a card that we actually wrote around. And you can see that the UE, which is like a form factor of a form. We also have one test with the hand around it, but this one's a, a test where we just roll it around in different places. Here it's a nice line of sight with a very coverage. But, but we actually take it through all the, the walkways and behind uh, and in the rooms. And you can see the sound is very good with a like, metal bag that we provide very good uh, reflections that can close things in even places that you don't see. Uh, a direct line of sight. And the green is actually showing that in many, many scenarios, we actually are getting the full spectrum of this in most of these places. So the whole floor was just covered with two base stations so you know, operating at full uh, power. So, showing the body blockage. So, so that the person moves behind it, so they actually switches. So in, in this case, you could actually see that it switched the, the base station. Okay, so that's, I think that's the video. So I'll stop here. I'll be glad to entertain any questions. Thank you. Change over pretty quickly. Uh, we don't have much uh, time. But so you're saying high end smartphones, millimeter wave capable by 2019. Is that what you're claiming here today? Yes. So we have chipsets and RF front ends that we are planning to commercialize in 2019. Incredible. All right. Um, cool. Uh, so I think uh, I'm fortunate to have people take questions offline because we're already over time for, for you. Uh, oh, okay. I'm sure people have a lot of questions. But soon we'll be here through tomorrow. Right? Yes. Okay, so track soon guard on for your 5G millimeter wave questions. Now I'm going to hand over to Brian to introduce our next speaker. All right, so welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome Zupan Shen to the stage. So Zupan uh, finished his PhD here, and Jeff and I were privileged to be his co advisors here in Huawei and uh, Beijing. The Zupox uh, talk today will be non orthogonal multiple access for 5G new radio. It's very active in 3G, PPT standards for the last 10 years. These previously worked uh, in wireless prior to Huawei and DI and dot on Mobile, currently involved in the standardization effort for multiplexing uh, and channel coding 20 publications and 100 patents. So, Zupox, good to see you. Yeah, thank you. And um, it's my honor to be here. I uh, joined the UC Austin in 2001, and that was before WCG was formed. Uh, Brian recruited, recruited me, then uh, Jeff uh, joined the UT Austin in 2002, then I was lucky to have two advisors at the time. Um, today I am going to talk uh, uh, one part of the many research or topics that uh, Huawei has been doing is uh, now also going to multiple access. <coughs> so multiple access schemes um, has been one of the fundamental topics that uh, wireless has been doing. Um, so we start from uh, frequency domain or time domain multiplexing and also then CDMA code domain, code domain multiplexing. So I actually do remember that in my PhD, PhD dissertation, those figures uh, are in the introduction of, uh, of my PhD uh, dissertation. Um, then we actually move into two-dimensional multi-user multiplexing where we see multi-user WebDM uh, type of research. Now um, here um, we are talking about uh, three-dimensional multi-user multiplexing. We can multiply uh, users in different uh, uh, dimensions, code domain, frequency domain, or time domain. Interestingly, in the power domain and also spatial, spatial domain can also be further um, exploited. And together, it's uh, really a multi-dimensional resource allocation or scheduling problem. Then um, we started a LT, actually in 4G LT, uh, there was some uh, study and the research and the specification about uh, uh, non orthogonal of multiple access. That was uh, uh, termed uh, uh, NICE or multi-user um, interconnect can cancellation type of technique. 
um, it was mostly focusing on the downlink. Um, in the 5G uh, side, in the resporting uh, re study item for the uh, new radio, there was quite a lot of discussion on also about the multiple access, but it was uh, mostly focusing on the uplink. Um, then all proposed multiple access uh, schemes will follow pretty much uh, this uh, diagram. Um, we have the bit level processing, we have the channel uh, coding, then we have the bit level interleaving or scrambling. So this is one part of the bit level processing. And then we have the symbol level processing, uh, mapping to the modulated symbols and also then symbol to the IE mappings. So this symbol level operation is actually where the fun is. We can generate a non-zero modulated components then map into the res uh, resources in order to get the uh, sort of more diversity and uh, to improve the system performance. <coughs> and the single level process and resource mapping we can we can have sparse or non-sparse uh, resource mapping. Then, with spreading how the main superposition we can do, then this will rely on the advanced receivers to separate the UEs. Then, with spreading, we can have additional code domain separation and a better inter user interference uh, suppression or rejection. Linear spreading, single level repetition, spreading code can be optimized to allow more UEs to collide and increase the multiplexing capacity. Non linear spreading, we can have additional gains in diverse state, uh, diverse states, moving gains in diverse states. So for this uh, uh, simple level processing, interestingly, those operations can be expressed in those simple forms. For linear spreading, we have the coded bits, we have the modulated symbols, then through, the, this, these are the coded bits, and then through a sort of pre-coder operation, then we can map to the modulated symbols. For the non-linear spreading, similar ex ex expression, but um, the operation of uh, uh, pre-coding will be sort of dependent on the input code uh, bits. Then, um, sparse code the multiple access, this is one of the things that Bobby has been doing research. So essentially the idea is that with a limited number of uh, time frequency resources, so for example, we have, um, we have four here, how we can multiply six UEs. So each UE's uh, code the bits will be encoded uh, through the SCMA modulation code book mapping. So basically is to generate one of the uh, coded, uh, few, two coded bits, or two coded uh, modulated symbols and map to two out of the four IEs. And different UEs will be uh, mapped to different uh, uh, resource elements in the frequency domain. So this is basically one work in tone, or it's called uh, uh, resource elements. Then one important or interesting property of this uh, SCMA is that we use sparse IE mapping. So the partial collision reduces the inter-user um, collision, then also importantly it can reduce the multi-user detection complexity. Then um, the codebook design, so remember this uh, uh, symbol as a codebook design, basically SCMA will need to design different uh, uh, codebooks. So example one is uh, the four point uh, code book where we have the two bits streams in, then through the precoder, then we have the output uh, modulated uh, symbols. Then this non-zero component one and non-zero component two basically enhances uh, the distance between uh, those modulated symbols and increase uh, the diversity. Then for the eight point, um, uh, eight point uh, SCMA code book, similar things can be done. We take three, Coded a bit scene, then we modulate it to two symbols, then these two symbols will be mapped to resource elements. Then these are some of the simulations that we have. So the top, top three are the four um, one transmit antennas and two receive antennas. Then the bottom three is for one transmit antennas and four receive antennas. So this is uh, more on the um, lower spectral efficiency, about 0 0.25 bits per second per hertz. Um, then we can multiply uh, um, different uh, uh, sort of uh, UEs here. So the, the leftmost one is the SNR gain over OFDM. So we can see that uh, with SCMA with eight points, so basically the coding rate is about uh, uh, one over three. 
Then we can have a roughly about 2 dB gain of the orthogonal uh, multiple of S scheme. Then this 2 dB gain also, as we see, that also holds true for different number of uh, antennas. Then in terms of the high overloading case, um, where we can have uh, uh, 4 to 12 degrees in those uh, 12 PRDs, and we can see that when we increase the number of EVs, actually the performance does not decrease. So this is robust to the overloading factor. So one of the important motivations to have the non of multiple access is for the sort of machine uh, MMTC type of services where we expect a large number of uh, connect, connected UEs in the system. Then also um, we need to consider how robust uh, this scheme is uh, uh, to the signature collisions. So on the rightmost one, we have six UEs. Um, then we show with and without uh, code book collisions what is the expected VI performance. And it turns out that with uh, the good design of the SEMA code books, there's almost a negligible performance even if uh, several UEs randomly collide with the same signature sequence. All right, then together with the uh, uh, non orthogonal multiple access um, in the 5G system, we also need to consider how to reduce the latency and the signal overhead and the energy consumption. So, in LTE, what we have is actually um, a UE, if it has data to transmit, it will send a scheduling request, then the UNOV will send a scheduling grant, then the data will be transmitted to the UE. So what we are uh, doing for NR is uh, uh, more importantly to do this uh, uh, grant-free transmission for sporadic uh, small packet transmissions. This has a benefit of low latency signal overhead reduction and energy consumption. Then SCMA or now also, also going to multi multiple access comes in because we support many UEs in the system, then it needs to be robust to UE collisions and provide a better spectrum. <coughs> Um, grant free for different UE states. Um, in commercial systems, in LTE, we have the RC idle state and the RC connected state. Then for the NR system, we are introducing a third state, which is so called the inactive data state. When the UE is inactive data state, it can still, it does not need to be maintained for RC connection, but when data arrives, the UE can transmit data immediately. So in 5G, we are expanding the normal uh, mobile broadband services into UIOC, ultra reliable low latency communication and the master MTC communication. And for this uh, grant free or the inactive state transmission, this is more important for this MMTC type of services where we expect a large number of uh, connected UEs. And this is some of the uh, real tests uh, that we have performed. So with grant-free, um, the signaling overhead can be significantly reduced because there are less signaling between uh, the network and the UE. So the UE, whenever it has the data, it can transmit immediately. And with SCMA, also the connecting, uh, connecti connectivity density also increased uh, uh, significantly uh, because we can uh, have a, a large num a high number of overloading factors in the system. So this comparison is compared to the 4G MBRT system. MBRT is a, a narrowband IoT services uh, operating on 200 kilohertz uh, bandwidth. Then also with uh, here we call the uh, echo state or basically it's the inactive data state and the transmission latency also reduces because there are less sort of communication handshakes between the network and the TV. So these are roughly the, my presentation on the uh, one part of the research that Huawei has been doing. Thank you. We have time for questions. Go ahead, How do you explain the good performance in the multiple user aspect that there's no change in performance when you get up to six users? Yeah, it's a sparsely and effectively, if effectively we are actually using the UE receivers. That is, as a trend um, that we see, we have uh, uh, sort of more capable UEs doing advanced receivers. Then typically it, 
there's some sort of the message passing algorithm or message passing algorithm is actually very complicated. We also yeah. develop other algorithms. What's, what's the overhead on that coordination? What's the overhead in terms of latency to be able to do that in the real system? Yeah, so overhead, I think, per se, is not between the network and the UE. This is more the sort of processing power at the UE side. So as a general trend, what we see is, uh, um, in LT side, we see that the UE is easy, easy, then it does not have a, a sort of, we do not mandate the UEs have a, a lot of processing powers. But at, as we see in the past five years, we are actually mandating the UEs to be more capable and uh, process uh, sort of uh, implement more advanced receivers. Yeah. One last question. Any? Thank you, Zipan. Thank you very much. I can't believe nobody was challenging this idea that I finally had multi-user detection in the uh, UEs according to the Zucom here. So that's what that's what you're, you're saying. We're going to have multi-user detection in the next generation of, uh, of uh, 3 gpp standard. Yes, we have uh, at the Huawei side, we have prototypes to uh, all, all of these multi-user detections and it has actually the iterative process. We do the multi-user detection, we, we do the channel decoding, then it's a iterative process to improve performance. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, it's actually very interesting and exciting. We have to talk about this. Um, okay, um, thanks, Nikon. So our, our next talk here um, is by uh, Zichin Lin, um, who's at Ericsson, and uh, he's been working on also PGPP standardization at uh, Ericsson. Um, it was one of the Ericsson leads on the recently standardized narrowband Internet of Things standard for in the IoT, um, which is just now being commercialized. Uh, right now he's leading um, air, air to ground broadband communications research and standardization, so kind of a futuristic uh, drone type communication for cellular. So I think we'll all be curious to hear about that. Um, like many of our alumni, he graduated in 2014, he was my student. I forgot to mention that uh, Sundar was uh, Sanjay Shakatai's student. Um, He's worked for many companies, uh, you know, not just one. He's, he's worked at Qualcomm in New Jersey, uh, the group, the Flareon group that was referred to some in our panel. He's worked at Nokia Siemens Group uh, up in uh, Chicago, uh, and at ALU Bell Labs in New Jersey. So he's, he's really uh, worked some of the premier wireless R&D uh, groups, and uh, he's been recognized at Ericsson as one of their top young innovators. So it's great to have you Thank you, Jeff. I joined uh, WCG in 2011, I still remember it took Jeff years, is perhaps more commonly known as drone. Much of the past research and development of mobile graphic communication has been devoted to terrestrial communication. Providing mobile broadband connectivity to the sky is an emerging field. So today I'd like to share some of our experience in this emerging area. So I will give you some background information, then I'll focus on discussing uh, mobile connectivity for UAV. Then I'll share some simulation and field trial results. In the end, I will conclude with some parting thoughts and welcome your questions. We know UAVs have different sizes and weights. They fly at different altitudes with different speeds. In this talk, we will focus on low altitude, small UAV. To, a bit, to be a bit more concrete, we can use a reference definition from the Federal Aviation Administration the FAA. According to the FAA guidelines, these small UAVs are UAVs that have weights no more than 55 pounds, a, flying, a maximum flying speed of 100 miles per hour, and a maximum uh, flying altitude of 400 feet above, above ground level. This small, the use cases of this small UAV are expanding quite rapidly. I bet some of you may have already heard about these attention-grabbing headlines in the past few years. In 2016, Domino, for the first time, delivered pizza by drones in New Zealand. In the same year, in 2016, Chipotle and Alphabet brought Burrito delivery drones to Virginia Tech. I guess this sounded quite attractive to hungry college students. <laughs> and beyond uh, this pizza and Burrito delivery, there are more series of package delivery. A prominent example is uh, Amazon uh, Prime Air Delivery. Besides 
package delivery, other use cases may include infrastructure, inspection and monitoring, photography, precision agriculture, public safety, and border control. Depending on the operation range of this small UAV, we can talk about drones that fly uh, within visual life sight and drones that fly beyond visual life sight. Depending on the degree of autonomy, we can talk about autonomous drones and drones that are controlled manually. So as you can see, this is really a large span of requirements and customer segments. These small UAVs are creating social economy benefits that are too large to ignore. According to a recent drone report from Goldman Sachs, between now and 2020, we will see a $100 million market opportunity for drones. According to another report from AUBSI, which is a non-profit UAV organization, through 2025, we will, we will see more than 100,000 jobs created and an economy impact of 82 billion in the United States alone. To truly unlock the potential of these small UAVs, we may need to rethink about the current regulations. In this slide, I put uh, together some current FAA regulations for flying drones without vehicles. As mentioned earlier, the maximum flying altitude is 400 feet above ground level. In terms of operation range, drones cannot fly beyond visual line sight. In terms of time, drones cannot fly at night, although in this slide I show a drone flying at night. And in terms of operation, drones cannot fly over people. But note this is changing. I just noticed last month, CAN received a special waiver from FAA. Now CAN can fly a drone, a small UAV over people. There are many ongoing efforts aiming to overcome these regulation barriers. NASA and the FAA have been working on a joint uh, collaboration project on UAV traffic management system. And last month, October 25, the White House and Department of Transportation announced an in innovative American aircraft system integration program. The purpose of the program is to integrate innovative drone applications into national airspace by pairing governments and UAV operators. To ensure safe UAV technology should be in place, mobile networks stand ready for authenticating, monitoring, and controlling these UAVs. The wide area secured connectivity provided by mobile networks can help enhance safety and operations of UAV beyond visual life sight. Mobile networks can also help achieve reliable UAV identification and registration using onboard eSIM cards. This can assist with air traffic control and law enforcement. Mobile operators also have a very uh, well-established reputation for maintaining privacy and data protection. So this can help UAV meet the highest security standards. Towards cellular connected UAV, the first step is to understand the performance of existing networks. Then we identify the performance enhancing solution in the second step. In this talk, due to limited time, I will just focus on the first step. That is, we try to understand the performance of existing networks. We know existing terrestrial networks are optimized for terrestrial coverage. The base station antennas are down tilted. Due to this down tilted base station antennas, UAVs flying in the sky may be served by the silos of the base station antennas. And where a UAV falls possible are uh, sudden signal drops. The other issue is related to interference compared to terrestrial propagation. Propagation in the sky is more close to line of sight free space propagation. So in the downlink, a UAV uh, receiving a signal from its signal may receive more interference from, from neighboring base stations as well. Similarly, due to this uh, close to free space line of sight propagation, in the uplink, when a UAV transmitting signal to its serving base station, can cause more interference to neighbor the base station as well. There is an ongoing VGPP effort aiming to understand the performance of existing telecom association for developing and maintaining system specifications for all the mainstream mobile technologies, aerial, with 10 MHz LTE carrier and the carrier frequency of 700 MHz. 
Each base station has two cross polarized antennas at the height of 35 meters with 6 degrees of down tilt. So the antenna pattern is illustrated in the uh, top right figure here. In the bottom uh, left figure, we show the downlink coupling gate distributions at three different heights. One is 1.5 meter, which is the ground level. One is 40 meter, which is 5 meter above the base station antenna height. And one is 120 meter, which is close to the current FA regulation limit. If we compare these, uh, the 5% type downlink coupling gate at these three different heights, we can see the 5% type downlink coupling gate at both 40 meter and 120 meter are higher than its counterpart at the ground level. This means the line of sight application in the sky can make up the antenna gain reduction of, uh, of silos of base station antennas, and this can lead to sufficient uh, signal strength in the sky. The figure on the right, the bottom right here, shows the downlink signal to interference plus noise ratio distributions at the three corresponding heights. So we can see, compare these distributions at different heights, we can clearly see the signal quality in the sky is much worse compared to the ground level due to the close to free space line of sight propagation. Reliable command and control of this small UAB is a very important connectivity requirement. So we would like to ensure we can deliver these packets within a certain latency uh, budget with very high uh, probability. So in this slide, we can see a very challenging simulation scenario where we have five drones per cell. Reliability in this slide is defined as the success of the ability of transmitting a packet within 50 milliseconds. So the figure on the left here shows the uh, distributions of latency performance in existing LT networks. And the figure on the right shows the downlink SIR distributions for the data channels. This table summarizes the main reliability statistics. So we can see uh, in the current setup, we can achieve pretty high reliability at heights up to 100 meters. And also we can see to achieve the same reliability performance, resource utilization is generally higher at higher heights. Mobility support is a very distinct feature of cellular networks. Mobility support is also very important uh, for UAV, but I think due to limited time, I'll skip this slide. Besides simulation, we also conducted um, quite a few of UAV field measurements and field trials. In this slide, we show one of the field trials we had in Ericsson, Finland. We tested the connectivity statistics up to 150 meters in this uh, field trial, and the figure in the bottom shows the connectivity statistics of ISRP and ISRQ values at the height of 150 meters when the drone was flying at 30 km per hour. So from the ISRP figure, we can clearly see the signal in the sky is pretty uh, strong and sufficient to cover this UAV. But from the ISRQ, which is a measure of the signal quality, we can see it can vary quite a bit depending on the flight paths. Okay, this is the last slide. I would say we are at an exciting time witnessing new and exciting uh, UAV applications emerging every day. I think this is a potential business opportunity for uh, mobile operators. Mobile networks stand ready for authenticating, monitoring, and controlling these UAVs by providing wide area connectivity and also help helping with uh, UAV identification and registration. Our initial simulation and field trials results suggest that existing LT networks can support initial UAV deployments. I would like to emphasize the discussion so far has been focused on existing LT networks without any performance enhancing solution for UAV. With performance enhancing solution and 5G technologies, we can provide more efficient connectivity for UAV, which is very important for future wide scale UAV deployments. So that concludes my presentation. Any questions? Thank you. Just uh, one question. I think you briefly talked about you know, the safety issues about drones flying around. So, so what is the current position about that? I mean, uh, what is the liability here when we have these kind of devices flying around? And uh, do you have any 
di Bandung or yeah, I think that, that is a very good question. Many people are concerned about uh, the safety of these uh, flying UAVs, especially in the future. There could be so many UAVs flying in the sky. So that's why the NASA and the FAA have been working on a joint collaboration project to uh, manage this UAV traffic man And also the White House and Department of Transportation have been looking into this issue as well. So let's see what will happen in the future. Other questions on this very interesting uh, topic? Yes, sir. Excellent presentation, and I happen to be very interested because I fly drones all the time. Okay. Use LTE. He's, he should be liable, right? Yeah, well, I'm trying to work on the security aspect. So, my question is have you looked at the uh, handover performance as you go from one side to another? Yes, in fact, we, we did look into this issue and we see, uh, depending on network environment, mobility support can be very challenging in the sky. One issue is the potential sudden signal drop due to the down-tilted base station antennas. And the other issue is the interference is very strong in the sky. So this is a uh, very interesting area where maybe we need some uh, potential mobility enhancing solution. Maybe time for one more question. Well, we need support, I would say. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. superstar graduates, um, even amongst the many great ones you've had, he's, he stood out as outstanding. And uh, did a, a postdoc with Giuseppe Cairo at USC, and is now an assistant professor at Virginia Tech, kind of a uh, full circle with Ted. And he was recently named the outstanding new assistant professor by the College of Engineering there, as well as he's won uh, the Best Damn Author Award from Comsoc and uh, several other Best Paper Awards. He's really, uh, and he's making me look bad in terms of how much NSF and other funding he's been getting lately. Uh, so I'm actually trying to write proposals with this guy. Um, anyway, Eric, please. Thank you very much, Jeff, for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, very glad to be back here um, after, I think, a couple of years. Um, and, and very fortunate to have been advised by uh, Jeff Andrews during my uh, grad studies here, and also to have worked very closely with uh, Francois. Uh, so thank you very much for all the training. Um, in this talk, I'm going to speak on stochastic geometry, um, in particular, 3GPP-inspired uh, stochastic geometry models for cellular networks. Okay. Uh, this is in continuation to what was already discussed. Um, in the panel before, so the basic introduction to stochastic geometry has already been given. Um, uh, as we all know, since the inception of cellular networks, they have always been visualized, designed in terms of deterministic layouts uh, um, of infrastructure nodes, space stations, and that is what Ted also alluded to. Um, and and uh, uh, but with the with the increasing, increasingly irregular and organic deployment of base stations in particular small cells. Uh, we are now entering slowly in what I'm calling stochastic geometry era of cell cellular network models, where uh, we are no longer visualizing uh, the wireless networks or, or infrastructure nodes in the network as deterministic models. We are modeling them as stochastic processes, and we'll see uh, what those are. And just to give a visual confirmation of what I'm saying, I did a very simple, very quick exercise on my Google Explorer yesterday. I just counted the number of papers containing uh, both stochastic geometry and cellular. And I just uh, plotted them here uh, from 2006 to 2016. And we see there is an explosive growth uh, in the number of papers that we are seeing on IGP Explorer on this topic. 
Uh, just indication of, of you know, how much interest this topic has been getting from at least the academic community. And I would also like to note uh, a very important paper here, uh, which actually came out of uh, WCG in 2011. It was uh, written by uh, Jeff Francois and uh, Radha Krishna Ganti, who is now an assistant professor at IIT Madras. Um, I think if we have to pick one paper that truly revolutionized and, and brought these tools to a uh, cellular community, it would be uh, this paper. And also for completeness, uh, there are many papers written before 2011 as well, uh, building tools and, and focusing on theory and also applications to ad hoc networks led primarily by Francois, which are not coming in this chart because we are restricting this, uh, this, this particular study to cellular networks. All right. Now, just uh, to give a very quick overview of what these models look like, uh, let's just look at the most basic, uh, pretty much the most basic model that we can think of. Um, in this model, we have uh, uh, all the elements of the network, including all the isobase stations and users modeled as independent uh, poisson point processes. Okay. So, if you haven't heard of a poisson point process before, what we really mean is that you construct a model in which all the points are just thrown uniformly at random independently of each other on plane. This is what you get. I hope I can make it work. Yeah. Anyways, so in this picture, this is what you get. You have uh, different types of base stations with different coverage footprints and users which are just distributed uh, uniformly across plane. Uh, this was uh, so called the first comprehensive model uh, to study uh, cellular networks, um, which evolved from the paper that I just quoted uh, by Jeff. And uh, uh, it is highly tractable, so you can do a, a lot of interesting analysis using this model, and this is still pretty much the state of art in, in, in stochastic geometry, as we'll see. And this tractability of this model is also one of the reasons why it is so very well accepted by uh, the, the academic community. Now, once you start asking, once we are past you know, the initial phase, you have to start asking questions about how realistic truly this model is. Right? So let's just do a quick part experiment and see uh, what, how our cellular networks are evolving. So one of the first things that come to mind is the formation of hotspots. Right? So you have a huge cluster of users uh, which are being served by a cellular network. And it turns out the simple way of modeling a cellular network is not really sufficient uh, to, to model this hotspot formation. So first, very quick observation based on uh, just a simple hot experiment. And as a consequence of that now, you have uh, small cells or you know, in future, hopefully, millimeter wave stations which are deployed specifically to cover those hotspots which means there is implicit coupling between the locations of base stations and the users that appear because of the formation of hotspots, which is not also captured by the simple way of modeling network. Okay. And then you have an inter and intra base station tier dependence because you won't uh, deploy base stations right next to each other, so there is some uh, repulsion that you have in, in the points in a, in a point process that is also not really captured. Uh, by the simple way of modeling a network. Okay, so the key takeaway is, uh, although it was a huge step up from deterministic models, there are still some deficiencies in the PPP model that we need to plug in before it can be, uh, it, it can truly match uh, the sophistication of models that, that are used, for example, in industry by 3GPP. And we'll comment on that shortly. Now, all these deficiencies that I mentioned, they are very, very well known in the community, and they have made many efforts uh, uh, to sort of uh, come up with new models, better models, more realistic models. There are three main directions that have been taken in the literature to, uh, uh, to come up with better models. So direction one is to introduce intra tier coupling. As I said, you won't be deploying these stations right next to each other, so it's uh, uh, important to model this repulsion in the locations of the base stations. Uh, people have used metal hardcore processes, generic point processes, determinantal point processes. A lot of papers actually came out of Hugh Austin uh, on this topic and also by Martin Hange. Uh, direction two is to introduce inter-tier coupling. Uh, for example, you won't really be deploying 
um, a small cell, say a PICO cell, right next to a macro cell. So there is some repulsion between different types of base stations as well. There is some work going on in that direction as well that people have used uh, for some whole processes to model this repulsion. Uh, again, this was uh, primarily led by Martin Hengi. Uh, third direction, which is of uh, most interest to us today, is the user base station coupling. There is also coupling between the user locations and where the base stations are, just because the base stations are deployed where there are no users. Right? So there is implicit coupling that is typically ignored. Okay? As you will notice in all these directions, we are just trying to introduce some form of coupling in the point process. Okay? So that is pretty much uh, uh, the theme of all these generalizations of EPP-based models. And since this direction 3 is more important, it actually turns out that 3GPP has done a pretty good job in capturing this coupling between users and base stations. So let's look at the models that are used in 3GPP and see if we can take some inspiration from those models and come up with stochastic geometry equivalent models or generative models that can match closely with the models that are used in 3GPP. So for 3GPP models, I'm basically going to focus on two things. I'm going to focus on the locations of users and, uh, in this case, small cell base stations, and, and try to uh, come up with some guidelines that we can use uh, in, in stochastic geometry modeling. For modeling users, there are two main classes of uh, models that are used. There is so a uniform user model in which the user locations are assumed to be uniform across the cell, and there is a clustered user model where uh, PGPP considers clusters of users pretty much in the same way as shown in this figure at the top on the right hand side. You have uh, circles which are denoting pretty much the hotspots and users in those uh, clusters which are the users forming the hotspot. And similarly, in uh, the small cell base stations, there are pretty much three main uh, configurations that are used in, in 3 one is the one where the small cell, this small cell here, is uh, deployed just uniformly at random in a cell, uh, no correlation or no coupling with the users. But in the other two configurations, there is very strong coupling. Uh, you pick up hotspot and deploy either a single small cell or multiple small cells within that hotspot. So there is explicit coupling that is captured in 3 g models. Now let's just do a, a quick comparison uh, between these models. How does PPP model truly hold up when we compare with these 3 GPP configurations? Okay. So we notice that it's pretty good. It's a pretty good generated model. And you, if you want to model the uniform uh, user configuration, but just because of the structure, we are not really capturing this clustering of users. Uh, it is not rich enough to model these hotspots, uh, uh, clustered users. And similarly, in case of small cells, it's pretty good uh, to model this uh, uniform deployment of small cells, but it is not rich enough to model coupling between small cells and users. Now, the next natural question to ask is, is there something that we can use besides EPP uh, that is almost as tractable but is slightly richer so that we can model these morphologies and these configurations as well? And, and fortunately, yes, you one can just go one step ahead of PPP and start using a uh, Poisson cluster process, which I'll introduce now, which will uh, handle all these deficiencies. So it will, it will fill up this gap that we have between the models used by two communities. Let's look at that model now. Uh, so PCP, uh, here I have two figures. On the left, I have a PPP model, just points uniformly distributed over space. And on the right, uh, is a Poisson cluster process model, which is a form of two entities. You have cluster centers, around, which, are, which are modeled as a PPP, and then you have uh, users around each cluster center, which are forming clusters. And now, if you compare it with a 3GPP model, one can think of each cluster as a, as a user hotspot. Right? And one can actually put a base station at the cluster center, and that will uh, uh, implicitly capture the coupling between the base station, base station and user locations. So we did that uh, using PCP, we came up with uh, several generative models that one can one can construct, which closely follow uh, 3GPP models. Uh, I'm just quickly going to go over them now. Uh, in the first model, 
we have users and all the base stations which are modeled as PPP. This is the baseline model that was uh, that was basically built in 2010-2011 uh, uh, in WNCG. And uh, then we enrich this model. In model two, what we are doing is we have clusters of users, okay, which are forming hotspots. And uh, in those clusters, we have one small cell or one base station deployment. So you implicitly again capture this coupling by deploying one base station in, in, in uh, each hotspot. In model three, we consider larger uh, clusters, for example, clusters of users in uh, an airport terminal where you may not have a single small cell, but you may have multiple small cells deployed. So here you have uh, co-located clusters of those small cells as well as users. So this is what that model would look like. And for completeness, in model four, in case you are interested in the coverage blanket, we also consider a configuration where you have cluster base stations and uniformly distributed users. We have done complete analysis of these models, uh, including their mathematical properties and the coverage properties and so on. Uh, people who are interested in stochastic geometry here would know uh, if you are interested in, say, uh, coverage analysis of these models, you would need things like contact distributions and, and, and nearest neighbor distributions of these models, uh, things that we have derived uh, relatively recently and used for wireless metric analysis like uh, you know, coverage analysis, rate analysis, and so on. And, and the mathematical details, I would have loved to go over them, uh, but because of uh, the limited time, we are skipping all of that. Uh, but just to give uh, a very quick idea of the tractability, now we know this model is realis realistic enough to capture all the configurations, uh, but there is this uh, uh, other dimension to this comparison as well, um, as, uh, as George Fox, a very famous statistician, once said, at the end of the day, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Right? So here, we are trying to come up with a model that is less wrong than the models that are used now. But, at the, but now, we also have to answer the usability question as well. Is it almost as useful as the models that are used today? Tractability of a PPP based model is very, very well documented. Uh, a lot of results can be found in post form as well. But it turns out that this PCP model is also not too far behind. Uh, it does because of the uh, added complexity. It, it is not as tractable, but instead of getting post form exact expressions, one can find things like bounds and approximations which are very close and, and also in post form. All right, now uh, a, a few performance insights. So what is it, so once we have these, once we have these, uh, these models, what are really we adding to, to, to our understanding? So here we do a very quick comparison of coverage probability of the four models. Here we are comparing model one, which is a baseline model, with uh, 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 model two, where you have one small cell deployed in the hot spot, and you increase the cluster uh, radius, and you notice that coverage probability decreases because the, uh, the distance between the points is increasing. You see a very similar trend here as well, where you have model three, you increase the cluster radius, separation between the points is increasing, coverage probability decreases, but there is a reverse trend for model four, where you increase cluster radius and coverage probability increases. So the point here was not really to bore you with these trends, but the fact that the same metric same change of uh, 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 parameter leads to different trends in different models. So when you make these uh, uh, performance uh, uh, evaluation type of performance, one has to be very mindful of what model we are using and, and map it properly to the deployment that one, one, one wants to start. And now obviously these models have uh, 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 utility in modeling hotspots which are becoming more and more important <laughs> with the increasing relevance of the new wave. Uh, base stations, uh, and, and we did this uh, very recent study on integrated access and backhaul, which uh, Salam is going to speak about next, so we are not going to go over this in more detail. Uh, my last slide, with some parting comments, he said that from deterministic, we have now entered into a stochastic geometry era, and uh, uh, in, just based on the thought experiments that we did in this slide, uh, one is actually compelled to think, is the next era going to be off? W stochastic models. This cluster process is a W stochastic process because you are modeling both uh, the randomness and the locations of the clusters and also distributions of the clusters. 
And there is another parallel work going on in modeling vehicular networks using another W-scatastic model where you model the road network using line processes and, and vehicles on those, uh, those roads using uh, a cause of mind process. So this would be just a party comment, uh, just food for thought, that we probably will have to start looking at W-scatastic models very carefully uh, uh, in, in, the, in the future of uh, wireless networks. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you again for being patient. As I expect, the one academic speaker in our session was the only one to go over his time limit, so I'm afraid we'll have to uh, postpone uh, questions. But uh, you know, and actually, the, this equation he showed, this is actually very, very simple. There isn't even a single inter integral, no special functions. Like, so just so you know, I think it's all, uh, that's as simple as it gets. Um, all right, so I'll hand it over to Brian now for the next uh, So thanks again for uh, the presentation. So a lot of the students you've heard from, or alumni, I should say, that you've heard from today, the first two were from the decade going into the 2000s, and then the, the, four, uh, the, the last four speakers are from the current uh, decade. So we've got, uh, now we have uh, Dr. Salam Akul, who finished her PhD in 2012, and the advisor of Robert Heath, MS at the University of Utah, and the PS at the American University of Beirut. And we're always pleased to have great students from UT Austin from all over the world come to our graduate program. So she's at UT, she's at AT&T Labs here in Austin. Central member of the technical staff. Her talk is going to be uh, entitled Integrated Access and Back Talk of 5G. She's a contributor to the 3GPP uh, standards, as many of our alumni are as well, which is wonderful. So, shalom. Thank you. Hey. So uh, thank you so much for uh, for the opportunity, you know, Professor Andrews and Professor Evans for the invitation. And uh, we are both very excited to be here <laughs> and, uh, um, to see all the familiar faces and, uh, and the crowd. So um, today um, I'm going to talk about integrated access and macro for, for 5G. And uh, this is something that we as AT&T believe that this is a very critical feature. Uh, for the deployment of 5G networks and, and beyond. And I'm going to build up on the several uh, features that the, this session has talked about, uh, from millimeter wave to normal to even analytical modeling that um, Harper mentioned and, and, and drones. Uh, so, um, so basically, moving from you know LTE networks that we currently know, where we uh, it got uh, macro cells and augmented them with small cells and amino advancements in order to uh, make sure that we have uh, spectral efficiency to, to deliver you know, tens of megabits per second um, a throughput uh, to the uh, uh, users. Uh, we uh, needed to um, enable even uh, tens and, and more uh, capacity enhancements in the network for 5G, so the, the challenge was how to do that. So we can, uh, of course, uh, make sure that the spectral efficiency is better, but there's only this much you can do with spectral efficiency without adding new infrastructure, without adding um, new um, uh, spectrum. So that's why uh, kind of moving to millimeter wave um, uh, spectrum was, was important to have all this uh, spectrum uh, available uh, towards us and uh, you know using the phase area with all the directionality enabled us to uh, have uh, the system utilization that we wanted but then as uh, um, you know, mentioned we need to wait actually um, so we can uh, you know solve the range problem with, with, with directionality but then there's the noise limitation problem so we have to um, bring these cells even closer together and deploy these ultra dense uh, networks <coughs> in order to have uh, the uh, small cells that we are augmenting with millimeter and closer and closer together. So really how do we do that? And uh, this is where you know ultra dense networks come into play and then how do we do with this whole um, small cell densification of massive MIMO with, um, uh, with, the, with the transport solution? Can we use fiber? Can we tap into fiber? Um, you know, tapping into fiber is, is very hard, and even it's not available in all places. So, uh, really, the solution is to move away from traditional single hub networks and uh, move uh, to uh, what we call uh, this integrated access and backhaul or uh, wireless multi hub self backhauling architecture in order to um, use 
the uh, millimeter wave spectrum efficiently <coughs> have a good system utilization and benefit from all the presence of all these uh, phase array uh, systems. Now, um, integrated access and backhaul can be deployed in band, so the backhaul and the access can be at the same frequency, but also can be out of band, uh, such that the uh, backhaul can be, for example, on millimeter wave, or even on license millimeter wave in 60 gigahertz, but then the, the uh, access can be in the LTE uh, bands. And uh, in uh, using uh, millimeter uh, uh, wave and uh, uh, mass of time, we can uh, preserve the half duplex constraint that uh, we can have so we can monitor the uplink and the downlink um, uh, channels uh, for route management and uh, for um, uh, uh, using um, uh, uh, you know, frame structure or scheduling uh, using this uh, half duplex constraint. Now, when we think really about um, the uh, backhaul, uh, and the multi-hop backhaul, the first thing that comes into mind is to deploy it using a true mesh network. But uh, really we have to think about scalability and efficiency and such, you know, mesh networks, they suffer from uh, limitations by the worst case scenario all the time. So for scalability and efficiency, we wanted to uh, explore the structured hierarchy uh, system in the, mesh, in the uh, backhaul network as opposed to the mesh network. And with that, we can actually use the uplink and the downlink channels that we already have for 5G um, for uh, integrated access and backhaul instead of like uh, having to design a new link between different relay nodes like we had to do in DT games, for example. So uh, integrated access and backhaul is like um, now um, will uh, start being standardized in 3GPP uh, in, uh, in January 2018 and probably will uh, continue on uh, for later releases as well for um, uh, next generation and standard networks. All right, so uh, the first thing we think about when we talk about um, you know, deploying uh, integrated access backhaul is like, what are the deployment scenarios and what is the channel model that we're gonna use? Um, so uh, of course, you know, we can have a backhaul that has um, uh, relays that have connections to different uh, base stations and um, uh, relays that uh, can uh, talk to multiple relays at the same time. They can be in less urban environments, they can be outdoor to indoor, maybe indoor um, and highways. Uh, but uh, uh, we need to figure out how to characterize these networks. And then the first thing that the uh, millimeter wave uh, backhaul suffers from is this um, uh, blockage effect. So association of millimeter wave is happens uh, because the blockage was much uh, faster than in the traditional time scales that we are used to in LTE. So where in LTE you can do handover at L3, uh, uh, L3 uh, type of handover in millimeter wave because of blockage you're looking at a, um, a switching that is much faster. Uh, so we're looking at time travel switching or uh, random mobility without involving any core network aspects. Now, in addition to blockage effects for uh, dealing with route switching in, uh, in backhaul, you also need to look at uh, issues like load or congestion at different uh, relay nodes and uh, latency issues. So, I mean, in theory, you can have uh, unlimited number of hops, but in reality, you will be limited by two or three hops because of latency issues. So, uh, the other aspect is this relay placement. So. Uh, where do we place the relays as network operators we're probably gonna uh, you know place them uh, uh, in, in relatively to the donor cells uh, you know proximity with a different line of sight uh, probability so having these new links that are from the donor to the relays or from the relay to the relay uh, actually um, need characterization this is not something that is available in the current 5g uh, channel mode so the current 5g channel mode does not account for these relay to relay uh, links that uh, that we need to enable integrated access and backhaul. Um, uh, so we have different LS probability, we have different angular spreads as we uh, relay nodes from the receive or transmit, we can have different correlation between uh, the uh, channel parameters. So all of these need to be taken into account in order to characterize the channel and then uh, be able to actually uh, analyze the performance of these uh, networks. So there are a lot of really protocol enhancements and physical enhancements that need to happen in order to enable uh, integrated access and backhaul. And here I just 
shows a couple of physical layer enhancements that we should be looking at in the uh, study added for 3 gpp and going forward. One of them is really the, uh, the, the frame structure and the scheduling. So there is um, this tight coupling in the resource allocation between the backhaul and, uh, 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 and the access and um, uh, in, in the resource allocation. And uh, uh, of course, you know, with the half of the constraint, the relay can only, for example, receive on the downlink of the backhaul and the uplink on the access or transmit of the uplink on the uh, backhaul and uh, receive uh, and I guess transmit on the downlink for the access. So we should have like this frame structure that takes that into account. We can have this baseline structure that I show in this figure, where it's like a static structure where every hop order has uh, a certain frame structure to account for this half to the next constraint. But in reality, we really don't have that. We have a dynamic uh, load or traffic on the uplink and the downlink that we have to take into account. So we have to do dynamic resource allocation. But when you start talking about that, you have this uh, cross-link interference, and then you need to measure it and then mitigate it. So it becomes like a graph coloring type of uh, problem. And then with cross-link interference, you might need to blend some of the resources on the uplink and the downlink in order to uh, make sure that you're measuring and mitigating this cross-link interference um, successfully. Another uh, thing that uh, we can uh, look at is uh, from physical layer enhancement point of view is this multiple uh, antenna enhancements. Um, so there's there's always a lot to be done in MIMO, uh, but uh, one of the things that we need to do, look at, for example, is multi-user MIMO enhancements and multi-TRB enhancements, or what we know as COMP. There are, um, uh, we would love to have, for example, a symmetry between the uplink and the downlink when it uh, comes to, um, you know, to backhaul, like in terms of rank, uh, uh, reference signals that we are using. Now, from the perspective of multi-TRP enhancements or, or comp, uh, what we used to have in FTE is this a transparent comp approach where um, the user did not really know whether the transmissions to it were coming from uh, one user or um, one, one, one transmission point or multiple transmission points. And that required, okay, okay the user was very simple, but then that required a lot of uh, coordination, scheduling, and uh, synchronization of the network. So uh, what we are proposing is actually a non-transparent type of scheme uh, for uh, 5G, and especially related to, uh, to integrated access and backhaul, where actually you can have independent schedulers at different um, uh, base stations, uh, different relays, for example, and uh, that would relieve some of the uh, you know, uh, needs on the scheduling and the transport, but of course it will add some complexity on the user, so that you can send different MIMO layers from different um, uh, you know, transfer points to, to, to the user. Um, so uh, this, uh, can, you know, this long transparency can be a very essential part of uh, integrated access and backhaul as well. Um, so uh, to summarize, really, um, integrated access and backhaul is um, something that is uh, very important to us as uh, network operators. AT&T has been the main driver uh, for this features, uh, standardization and deployment of the network. This is something that is gonna begin standardization in uh, 3 gpp in January um, of uh, next year, and then uh, moving forward. There's a lot of issues that need to be solved. I've maybe scratched the surface in this uh, presentation. Protocol layer issues, physical uh, layer enhancements in order to make this a uh, reality but we think it's a very good potential in order to put the system utilization in the way networks. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, um, so 
actually I'm a TDM, a strategy approaches for, for IAB, but when they're not very scalable when you're talking about deploying several uh, relays in, in one coverage area. So maybe a special division of collapsing would be a more scalable solution. And then and then you would hit, you know, when you talk about dynamic TDD, you would hit uh, the cost of interference and then you need to get it. I'm not learning that. I'm just saying for the mutual low interference in the internet part, it's pretty hard. Yes. Yeah, it's something that is Thank you. Time for one quick question. What's on top of sectorization of access points? Definitely, multi-user mind is a key factor here. Considering that the access points themselves might already be sectorized. I can't do that. Uh, the access points themselves might be already sectorized. Uh, like, we still, uh, are you thinking about multi-user MIMO for each sector? Sure, I mean, multi-user MIMO basically you can have from multiple TRPs connection to one, one, one TRP or, or <coughs> multiple, sorry, um, sorry, one TRP connecting to multiple TRPs or multiple TRPs on the uplink to uh, one TRP. This is yeah, something that is naturally should be there for, for, the, for the macro. Thanks so long. I guess this is like finally going to come uh, actually work. This PhD for Nokia and then for a while for Intel. And has recently joined a venture backed startup um, in Silicon Valley uh, doing, uh, well, like he'll talk about it, a software defined radio, which I thought it would be. Actually, I'm going to speak in the capacity and contributor uh, to XRAM and also a promoter of XRAM philosophy. So, uh, I, I, for those of you who don't know what XRAM is, hopefully this talk will also serve as an introduction to XRAM. Uh, this is actually my sixth TWS that I'm attending, uh, but the first as a non UD affiliation. Okay. So, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Uh, the title is, of course, full of jargon. I won't talk about it right now. So, uh, so if you look at the existing RAM architecture, <coughs> it's very vertically integrated and very window specific. So, what does that mean by that? Just like if you buy, <coughs> buy a e all the algorithms to I'll mean, just give you an example. So let's say operator, one operator funds Jeff uh, to uh, design a world-class load balancing algorithm. Tell it to basically optimize this load balancing algorithm. Right? So think of, to give you an analogy from a computing world, think of Intel asking Google to run Intel supplied algorithms on Intel servers. Almost unthinkable, right? But we have been living with this philosophy in RAM. Increase the entry barrier in, in this telco world. Right? So, what is the ideal vision that you'd like to look at the RAN architecture? Right? You'd like to decouple the control and user plane. So, control plane, I mean the brain of your network. User plane is the hard worker who's delivering bits over the network. Right? So, you want to decouple these two aspects of your network and have at the top layer, also have the operator to provide policy. Although you want to program these algorithms, but you want to run these algorithms at the latency. That's the control loop one. The control loop two would be operating at the order of, let's say, five to one, five millisecond to one, and then you can abstract, abstract algorithms and control plane functionalities like load balancing, US management, SON, link aggregation. You name it and you got it. Right? And loop three would be operator specific policies and lifecycle management issues. For example, operator wants to instantiate a slice, uh, wants to instantiate, say that, okay, provide a policy to the network saying that uh, video users should get this kind of SLAs or this kind of performance. That, that kind of control loop can run on an order of five seconds to minutes. 
So to meet these new challenges, uh, a body called XFAN was formed in 2016. It's an operator-driven effort to develop, standardize, and promote such a software-based, abstracted, and extensive radio access network. It's formed by these three leading operators in 2016, and we have almost doubled our membership in 2017. And all these players are looking towards making these new challenges into re-architecting the RAM. So it's part of a unified operator-driven approach that we follow. So operators would lay out the requirements that they would like to see in the networks. Then we have a collaborative vendor development ecosystem. Vendors work together on how, where to place, how to meet these different challenges, where to place which uh, brain functionality of the network, in which group. And then we have operator trials, uh, proof of concept, and eventually we roll out a spec. That's the philosophy of XRA. So hopefully at this point you've got a broad understanding of what, how, and why we're doing this. Right? So uh, for the rest of the talk, I'll dig a bit more into the middle piece of the RAM controller and talk a little bit more about what we have done in that piece. So as I said, you want to innovate on this brain faster. So the modularity of this controller is, is key. So that brings in new requirements for this controller. So you want this, uh, this controller to reflect a sort of a real-time state of the network in a sort of a logical manner, not physical manner. So that the, that state can be consumed by these control applications. Control applications like QoS management, self-organizing, optimizing networks, load balancer, price manager, stuff like that. Okay. So that's what uh, the first requirement is. Right. And you want to expose this kind of interface to these algorithms to read and write to this network state. So it's sort of a database. So you read the net database, which is effectively your network state. And then when you try to write to this network state, just basically changes your network state. And this is what the abstraction you want to work at. Right? The application developer doesn't need to, or the load balancing algorithm doesn't need to concern itself with all the murky details of what's happening down below. And that's how the computing world, abstraction the computing world has worked and successfully for now. Also, we want this controller to look at the knock palm and ingest operator policies and application intents. So for example, operator says, uh, I want all my video services to at least get two MVPs. So how do you ingest that? How do you understand that? And translate that into a specific brain function. That's your knock palm interface. Right? And of course, once that translation happens, you want to direct your infrastructure to conform to that to provide that kind of requirements and SLAs. So basically, translate control bar apps and operator intents into southbound RAM specific SLAs. Okay. So in this direction, uh, what we have done, we have, uh, with the next RAM, has published a reference architecture for such a modular RAM controller that can be found online. And we have partnered with Open Networking Foundation to basically implement a carrier-grade scale controller. And this controller interfaces with RAN infrastructure, an E node B, through Southbound interface, and allows ability to induce changes in the network at a very abstract level. So I'll give you an example in the next slide of what I mean. So let's look at this simple task. Of, uh, of handing off a user. So we're looking at a scenario where both these users are connected to cell A. Both the users have excellent signal from cell A, but because both of them are connected to the same cell, the cell is overloaded. We rather move this cell, let's say user 2, to a weaker cell, just to ease the load on this guy, and also give user 2 better performance. Simple task, operate again. in the current architecture. And this because it has to work through a vendor which provides high integration with their existing mobility management and hardware. 
So what would XFAN do? This controller do? So controller would expose a network, logical network state, and an application which is like a load balancing application can just say, I want to modify link A to 2 to be of uh, non-serving. So A to 2 is right now serving, B to 2 is sort of an interfering link or a non-serving link. So we want to modify link B to 2 to be a serving link. That's all what the application says in the first arrow. The controller interprets this as a handoff message and then tells cell A, cell B to, to the handoff. Right? So at the, at the application developer level, you don't need to be concerned about what will the controller do. Right? You will have to just read this network state and write to this network state. Of course, there's a lot of details uh, that, that go onto the rug, but that's the point. Right? The point is, that we have to build these kind of abstractions so that we can have different layers of innovation and these can work in parallel. Right? An app developer doesn't, doesn't need to know and should not know what happens down below. Right? So there is demo of uh, uh, this architecture on these links, which feel free to have a look. So, uh, so far the achievements of uh, this organizations are listed here. Uh, so it was announced in October 2016. Uh, we demonstrated this decoupling of control plane and user plane. In MWC Barcelona, we demonstrated these actual use cases working with two uh, different enotries working across. And in, in this year, MWC, in, in the, uh, August uh, 2017, MWC, we showed uh, a carrier grade and controller interpreting these high level messages and orchestrating and changing the network state correspondingly. We also have a, a front hall working group which is working on more the low fi and high fi split. Uh, we have a good a member growth and a lot of operator interest as well. With that, I'll end my talk. Thank you. Cisco and TI, I think Intel, but none of the incumbent box, Ericsson, Nokia, bring them into the tent, or is this so, this big one goes to such kind of, uh, but we are trying to convince them it is not, and operators are already on the board, so they are, they are asking these vendors and socializing with these vendors about this new architecture, definitely operators forward, so it was really interested in bringing these vendors on board as well. So we'll see. We'll copy here some announcements. Last question? Thank you. Uh, as the RCU spread of being a research target for my 5G community for several years, but uh, as I said, I have noticed uh, so far, the GPP hasn't uh, showed much momentum to support this. Uh, it is slicing it, but the CEO split or SDA architecture is not yet. So what's your plan? To, do you want to uh, push this to 3GPP or well, what's your plan? So yeah, that partly answers, answers the motivation that they, we have not seen momentum in 3GPP around these ideas. And uh, so XRAN is probably uh, trying to show the viability of these ideas. And hopefully, uh, when, when vendors come on board, uh, we'll see that traction eventually going to the All right, I think we'll go ahead and close today. Thank you, Sarja. Great talk, very interesting. So uh, we're close for today. We'll start back at 8.30 in the morning here same place. Um, well, feel free to show yourself around the building. Look around the atrium out there. Um, WNCG is on the sixth and seventh floors of this building. Feel free to uh, go upstairs and, and just walk around. The university is open to public. And uh, we'll see you all tomorrow morning. Thank you.